Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to this provocatively titled open forum on whether platforms and human rights are a contradiction in terms. My name is Joe McNamee. I've had the honor and privilege to work on Council of Europe working groups on roles and responsibilities of intermediaries and most recently as co-rapporteur on a draft recommendation on automated decision making. The past few years have been very exciting from a data protection perspective with the entry into force of the reformed Convention on Personal Data, Convention 108 Plus, as well as the first years of operation of Europe's general data protection uh, regulation. In this panel, we will look with esteemed colleagues at the expansion of data protection rules internationally and the roles and responsibilities of businesses in relation to privacy and data protection. In particular, we will look at our direction of travel. How close are we to a global framework that works in practice as well as on paper? A global framework that ensures respect for our fundamental rights to privacy and data protection. What is our destination? How close are we to it? We need to be very conscious of the fact that without privacy, we cannot have security. Without privacy, we cannot speak freely, anonymously, or without fear of retribution. Without the freedom to speak and move freely, we cannot associate freely. If we cannot speak, associate or move freely, we cannot hold power to account. If we cannot hold power to account, our human rights are at the whim of authority. Lack of privacy is therefore the very antithesis of human rights and democracy. We will start with a round of introductory comments and hopefully we'll be able to open up to some question and answers after that. Our speakers today are Jan Kleissen, uh, who is Director of in the Information Society Directorate of the Council of Europe on the Action Against Crime. Alexandria Walden is Global Human Rights and Free Expression uh, Policy Council at Google. Uh, Fanny Hidvegi is European Policy Manager at Access Now. Rami Alfrati is Senior Cyber Fellow at the Tel Aviv University and former head of the Civilian Division of the Israeli National Cyber Bureau, Prime Minister's Office. And uh, Florence Renal is Deputy Director, Head of uh, Department of European and International Affairs at the CNIL. So I will keep as quiet as I can about a subject that I'm very passionate about and uh, hand over the floor initially to um, Jan Kleissen from the Council of Europe. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. In recent weeks, we've seen two very powerful statements, amongst others, on the issue that is the title of this session, uh, human rights and digital platforms. One came from a person that we would normally associate with these issues, namely the UN, uh, United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur, David Kay, who came out with a report uh, very strongly uh, pointing out that the respect for human rights on digital platforms left to be desired. A second statement came from someone we would not normally associate with these issues, uh, a British actor by the name of Sasha Baron Cohen, who made a remarkable speech uh, just a few days ago, uh, which has been widely circulated, uh, and I think deservedly so, uh, on the internet, and uh, the social media, and for those of you that haven't seen either, I would, or haven't read David Kay's report and haven't seen Sasha Baron Cohen, I would like to uh, very much encourage you to do so. Um, there was one phrase in the statement by Sasha Baron Cohen which, which struck me particularly, I must say, uh, and which I would uh, describe as de debunking the myth that, that freedom of expression covers everything on social media. And I think he rightly pointed out that those that deny or justify the Holocaust on social media are not offering an academic point of view. They're preparing the next one. 
On this note, um, I'm sitting here representing the Council of Europe, which is an international organization uh, especially founded to prevent the horrors of World War II from repeating themselves. Uh, our founding fathers include uh, Winston Churchill, Konrad Adenauer. We celebrate 70 years this year, um, and we have adopted, in the course of those 70 years, uh, for our 47 members now, so nearly 850 million Europeans, uh, some 200 treaties, including the European Convention on Human Rights, which a number of you may be well aware of. It is a binding and enforceable treaty, and it does cover human rights, whether they are uh, violated online or in the real world. It applies to both. Um, and uh, referring to the very nice booklet that we all received, the uh, agenda for the 2020s, uh, the one of the opening statements by Finn Cerf, with whom I, I usually 100% agree, uh, but in this case would like to differ slightly, because he calls, he points out that in the field of, of, of privacy and, and uh, internet governance, we need enforceable treaties, but don't, they are not yet there. There I would slightly disagree. These treaties do exist. On cybercrime, there is the Budapest Convention, which binds nearly 70 countries worldwide. It originated in the Council of Europe, but has grown far beyond Europe's borders. And last year, we were active with capacity building in the fight against cybercrime in more than 130 countries. On data protection, there is Convention 108, which you already mentioned. Convention uh, 108, is a binding international treaty uh, enforceable by the parties to the, to the treaty through a, a committee of the parties, which is called the TPD, and in which now also nearly 70 countries cooperate. There are nearly 60 parties, but more, more than those, uh, more, parties, uh, more countries than parties already cooperate, preparing themselves for accession, which is about half the countries in the world that have data protection legislation at all. So there is a binding international treaty. And therefore, uh, I would take this opportunity to urge all of you who uh, have not yet, from countries that have not yet adhered to this treaty, which was, by the way, um, recently modernized with the input from civil society, with the input from academia and other international organizations, uh, to consider uh, cooperating with, with, with us or acceding to this treaty. And I'd like to close, in order not to abuse my speaking time, um, with, a, with a reflection. Um, law enforcement and data protection. When we think about those two issues, we usually consider the restraints and the uh, uh, conditions under which law enforcement may use data. And this is, for instance, uh, an issue that is being discussed at the moment in Strasbourg, uh, when we speak about a protocol to, on cloud evidence to enable law enforcement to have easier and, and uh, quicker access to evidence held in the cloud, because nowadays most cyber crimes are, uh, go unpunished. There is virtually impunity. I think one case in not even a million actually gets, leads to a conviction. However, there is another issue regarding criminal law and data protection. Our societies and I speak uh, in a, perhaps the, the privileged position here in the Council of Europe as someone who's responsible both for freedom of expression and the fight against crime in, the, uh, in our member states. Our societies criminalize behavior that seriously harms individuals or society. Is it therefore perhaps not time to start considering whether those that deliberately breach data protection regulations, that deliberately uh, sell or uh, uh, violate uh, privacy provisions, whether those people should not be held also criminally responsible. I'd leave it with this question and I thank you very much for your attention. That's a very interesting final question. I hope we come back to it in the discussion later. Um, next we have uh, Alexandria Walden from Google. Uh, thank you. Thank you for including us in the conversation today. Um, 
My expertise is in human rights, and I come from a background of doing civil and human rights and social justice issues, and I bring that work to, um, I bring that work and that experience to what I do at the company. Um, and so while there are thousands of people who work on privacy every day, my remit is to look at how we approach human rights across the business. So I just wanted to back up a little bit and talk about um, how Google approaches human rights. From our, from our perspective, we believe in technology's power and potential to, to have a profound effect um, and positive impact on the world. In everything that we do, we're guided by internationally recognized human rights standards, and we're committed to respecting the rights enumerated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, and its implementing treaties. An important part of that for us is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and the Global Network Initiative Principles. That informs the way in which we operate, we operationalize these commitments across our business. In addition to actively harnessing the power of technology to respect and advance human rights and create opportunities for people across the globe, um, we're committed to responsible decision making around emerging technologies. This approach includes important pieces um, in terms of the way we integrate the issues across the business. So one piece that I think is critically important to the way companies are addressing these issues, both in how they design products, but also in terms of how they engage with governments and contribute to thinking around policy. One aspect of that is executive commitment to human rights and engaging on these issues. Another important piece is internal processes for conducting human rights due diligence and HRAAs. Lastly, um, it's important that companies, and specifically this is important to Google, um, to do external engagement and consultation with experts around how we develop our policy positions, our products, and those features. Um, and so if you take that as the foundation for how we approach these issues, um, I'd like to just kind of hearken back to what Jan said about some of the key issues that we're focused on and facing in the world today, both from the, in the realm of privacy and in the realm of free expression. Uh, we come to the table to engage with stakeholders around the way these problems are actually um, sort of emerging and evolving to ensure that what we are doing with our products is actually um, addressing the problems as our users are experiencing them and as governments are experiencing them as well. So just I, I guess I'll say in closing that um, I think it's important for us as we talk about what companies are doing in this area and how companies are maintaining their commitment to human rights to always tie that back to the UNGPs and ensure that we are having a conversation around the UNGPs um, that is evolving in, alongside the way that we're viewing these issues in the world. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, We'll, I'll pass the floor straight to uh, Rami Al-Frati um, from Tel Aviv University. Shalom, good morning. Uh, my name is Rami Al-Frati. I'm coming from Israel. I'm the self-nominated cyber ambassador of Israel. And uh, since I don't know how many of you have been to Israel, I would just like you to raise your hands if you visited Israel, because I'm going excellent. So while speaking about privacy, whenever you are coming to Israel, the first thing that you are you find is while coming to any supermarket or any uh, movie, cinema, you find somebody, a guard, looking at your basket or looking at your clothes or looking at you in order to find out whether you're a terrorist or not. So I would like to discuss very quickly and very briefly the, uh, the main question, which is uh, uh, what is the right for uh, privacy and data protection way is it also valid while we are speaking of terrorism activities? And what is the right way to communicate with the digital platforms? Just to make it uh, very, very uh, clear, in Israel we have two main organizations dealing with cyber and privacy. One is the Privacy uh, Authority. The second one is the Israeli National Cyber Authority. It goes together. Speaking about privacy cannot be done unless you are dealing very well with the cyber as well. And therefore, we also decided, uh, the, the government of the State of Israel decided to start up also with uh, what is called a cyber law, because without a cyber law, 
taking in care also this uh, privacy issues, we believe that you cannot uh, uh, work in the right way. We are looking at ourselves as, uh, as a leading country, both in cyber, but also in privacy. And you'll be surprised, but GDPR became a very important, take a very important role in our life. But our life is totally different from most of you. Uh, we just heard from Jan about the uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, what he said. We can speak about security, we can speak about what is the role of the digital platforms when we are speaking about anti-Semitism. We can speak about it when we are speaking about money laundering and uh, pedophiles and as well. So what is the question and what is the way that we should uh, deal with it? The, the digital platforms takes a very important role, not only when you have to protect yourself, but also if you're a terrorist. And unfortunately, you find out that most of the, of the uh, digital platforms, terrorists are using these platforms against privacy. When the terrorist is using a platform, a digital platform, he knows very well that it is open to the public. So when it is open to the public, he can understand that also it is valid for the law enforcement agencies to deal with it. And what I would like just to, uh, to come out with, with a highlight is what are the tools that the government has to give for law enforcement agencies in order to deal with cyber when cyber is with, with terrorism or anti-terrorism when the main platform is a digital one. And I will be more than happy to uh, answer questions about this one uh, later. Thank you. We have some very well-behaved panelists who are staying well within their time. It's, uh, great. <laughs> That's not to put pressure on Fanny. And uh, Fanny and Veggie from Access Now. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll behave too. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, being here. My name is Fanny. I'm the European Policy Manager of Access Now. Access Now is a global uh, human rights organization. We work at the intersection of human rights and technology. So we are engaging on topics like privacy and data protection, freedom of expression, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and more. Uh, so this panel couldn't be more timely for us. And I'm uh, based in Brussels, and one of our key topics has been in the past few years the uh, adoption of the general data protection regulation. And my colleagues work on it, so I'm really glad that the panelists are addressing that topic. Um, Going back to the title of the session for a second, and contractual terms. In our, in our view, contractual terms are not enough to provide adequate prevention, mitigation, protection, uh, and redress, even for normal uh, uses of uh, platforms and services, like Facebook, for instance, much less in the event of uh, misuse and abuse. We need incentives and we need business models that respect human rights. Companies have the responsibility both to know about the impact of their products and services on human rights uh, by conducting due diligence uh, and working with outside stakeholders, but also to demonstrate that they are taking meaningful measures to prevent and mitigate these adverse effects. On the government side, we talk often about the, the obligation of uh, lack of interference with fundamental rights, but we have to mention the positive obligations as well that states need to create an environment for the full enjoyment of uh, human rights. This panel focuses on business models of platforms mostly, but when we mention human rights and companies, we must also account for different, different types of violations. So I want to highlight that companies such as the NSO group and the hacking team make it possible for repressive regimes to target those who oppose them in order to stifle dissent. The covert nature of targeted spyware makes it in, in the tool of choice for authoritarians. We see the role, on the other hand, of the big companies taking actions like the WhatsApp litigation that they brought uh, in the court of California. When we talk about the governments and the companies' uh, responsibilities and obligations at the moment, and, and maybe that ideal scenario that you asked for, we are failing on both ends. As the session description rightly mentions the Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal as a key moment. That scandal was a foreseeable consequence of a business model of harvesting and exploiting data and not respecting privacy. 
it created a momentum maybe to mainstream the urgent need for the enforcement of privacy and data protection rules or the adoption of comprehensive frameworks in areas where they don't exist. In contrast to the Snowden revelations, however, it has not led to meaningful reforms yet. It has translated into political talking points about addressing disinformation, mostly by self-regulatory measures, but no systematic reform of strengthening safeguards against micro-targeting. To bring a European example, the way the Snowden revelation helped move the needle in the adoption of the GDPR, it was just last week when we pronounced the e-privacy reform dead or zombie at best. The European Union must follow through and complete the reform after the GDPR to provide protections against online tracking and to ensure the confidentiality of electronic communications. Um, I will, I, I'm looking forward to discuss all of these topics at once in, in, in 60 minutes. I will solve them. And thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, we have uh, Florence Renal from the <laughs> French uh, National Data Protection Authority, the CNIL. Hello, everybody. I'm Florence Renal. I'm working for the CNIL. Uh, I'm very honored to be uh, with you today. Uh, just in case, uh, let me um, recall uh, what is the, the, the CNIL. It's the French Data Protection Authority. Uh, in fact, we are regulating data protection in France. Uh, our role is to advise companies, but also public bodies uh, in complying with the, the, the GDPR and French law. Uh, and we are also enforcing uh, the law on uh, our territory. Um, digital platforms is truly a very interesting case study uh, from a privacy uh, point of view. Um, indeed, um, in today's world, uh, it's technically possible to collect enormous amount of data, but there are privacy risks associated uh, to this. Indeed, mass collection can offer great opportunity of data combination and a big potential of profiling we need to be very cautious about. In certain cases, new techniques are used, such as artificial intelligence and facial recognition and other automated systems, which must be carefully framed because they raise privacy challenges. This can lead to blacklisting, discrimination, abusive decision for the people. We also see phenomena such as creation of big data reservoir where companies can pick and choose and lead to the development of a huge data market without much control. This needs to be done uh, with legal basis in a transparent way and with possibilities for the people to control this collection and reuse. Uh, it raises also other privacy issues such as data retention, security, also pose issues with respect to qualification of responsible parties, which is crucial in order to identify who is responsible for what. GDPR provides for tools to uh, the people to better control their digital life. They provide tools to exercise their rights right to object, right to be informed, right to erase, and right to data portability. This is a very important uh, right uh, that helps also uh, to rebalance the asymmetrical relationship with companies. Um, GDPR also provides for duties to company on the way they process data, uh, and um, I would like just to mention here Article 22 about profiling which is a very important uh, uh, provision with respect to uh, com data combination and use of uh, new technologies to create profiling. Uh, so GDPR gives a robust framework to uh, under uh, new practices. It's also, um, it's also provide a way for uh, digital platform, but more generally public bodies and companies 
to uh, develop policies uh, that also uh, c correspond to expectation for users uh, on their privacy and at the end also can become good for the business in, in order to, uh, to provide trust uh, to the customers and, uh, and at the end have a good business model. With respect to all uh, those um, uh, type of processing that we see happening, uh, we are issuing guidelines and tools to accompany business in order to comply with the GDPR. Uh, for example, recently we have developed a DPI tool that can uh, really uh, being seen as a success uh, as a tool, uh, to, as a compliance tool. And we are also doing some um, enforcement action. Maybe you have uh, seen some uh, action with respect to Facebook and Google with respect to data combina combination, lack of transparency, but also um, other, uh, other platforms such as BlaBlaCar and dating website where we found out security, transparency, consent issues. Uh, there is a, also an important factor linked to the geography of some of these platforms and big internet operator, operators that are not necessarily located in the EU uh, and uh, where data are transferred abroad and store and reuse abroad. And on this case, GDPR brings also a very clear policy message uh, with Article 3 and the territorial scope of the GDPR. In, uh, to summarize, um, to summarize this is if you do business in the EU, you must respect EU rules, either because the company is established in the EU or because uh, the business uh, is targeting the EU markets. And it's a very important provision, uh, which in a certain way put EU and non-EU actors on the same equal foot. And uh, provide if, if they could target the European markets. Um, EDPB, so it's the legal body at the European Union gathering the 28 data protection authorities, have recently issued some important guidelines with respect to this territorial scope. But we need to go further than that. We need to be more ambitious because those global issues are in fact also need also global solution. Uh, in that line, we truly support Convention 108 plus uh, as a, a, possi a possible instrument to resolve conflict of laws and to offer a common solution. Uh, as uh, Jan said, it's uh, the only binding instrument that exists today at regional level. Uh, and that is open to a third country, so it can, can really uh, be seen as an international instrument and not only as a regional instrument, uh, covering both public and private sector and also intelligence processing, which is uh, uh, very important as we've seen that today, also with um, adequacy decision taken by the Commission. It's really well articulated with the GDPR, and it creates a great forum of cooperation between data protection authorities and government at international level. Going back to the title, Contradiction in Terms, uh, we really think that we can have a kind of a win-win situation where privacy is good for business because it's good for people. Privacy should be seen as a chance, an opportunity also to create trust and to improve the quality of services because at the end, again, it respects the expectation of user and privacy and their fundamental rights. So just to finish, we think with that we can have a common interest to avoid contradiction. Thank you very much. One of the questions that we were asked to consider in preparing this panel was what should governments do? And uh, I think we had the full range of possibilities proposed by our five speakers. Um, Jan uh, pointed to Convention 108 and the GDPR as uh, strong pieces of international legislation and um, wished for broader um, continued take up of Convention 108 and reflected on the need for criminal sanctions. Fanny wanted the law enforced more effectively and uh, enhanced with e-privacy rules. Um, 
Florence uh, pointed to the reinforcement of the GDPR with, uh, with uh, tools and guidelines. Rami talked about reinforcing uh, privacy by stopping criminals from uh, abusing privacy online. And Alexandra pointed to a non-governmental um, multi-stakeholder engagement to uh, achieve our, our goals. Um, I would like to ask um, our panelists if they want to come back on any of the uh, comments made by their fellow panelists before um, looking to see if there are questions from the audience. Okay, um, the floor is now open to the uh, to the audience, we start with a question straight in front of me. If you could introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Steve Del Bianco with Net Choice. And the question would be equally framed to the digital platforms represented here, Alexandria, as well as the governments. And if there were courts here, I'd love to understand that too. When platforms adopt the UN Declaration of Human Rights, how shall a platform balance two rights that are in conflict with each other. And, and the example I would give you is the right to be forgotten, which is sort of an exercise of the 12th human right principle with respect to privacy against number 19, which says that humans have the rights to seek and receive information and ideas through any media. So I seek to know whether to lend money to an individual, but that individual is using the right to be forgotten to deny me the ability to know that they've been bankrupt, or a doctor whose license is revoked or a child care provider who's had a criminal conviction. You get my drift, I'm trying to come up with an example and ask for help on how to balance human rights that are in conflict. Thank you. I think I'd, I'd be interested in, uh, in Alexandria coming back on that, and in particular, whether you think it's likely that Google would choose to Im impose uh, a decision on the right to be forgotten in cases where somebody would be harmed because they didn't have a proportionate right to, uh, um, to ask for the right to be forgotten in the first place. Um, Facebook, or sorry, Google uh, needs to um, impose or to de-index or de-link content in situations where it would be unfair on the individual. Uh, to have certain search results come up. Um, and a harm that, is, that the gentleman just described would not be compatible with, with that. So do you see a, a challenge in that for you? Um, well, as with all things in human rights, there are oftentimes not simple um, answers or solutions, especially when rights are, um, are or appear to be intention. Um, but I think the sort of that's the, a little bit about the beauty of the UN guiding principles on human rights. They refer back to the government's duty to protect human rights, um, and they refer to a company's responsibility to respect. And so ultimately, um, what it does is point out that certainly there are actions that government should take, and companies have to think about how they respect the law in the countries where they do business. And then in addition, companies have to do their own balancing, their own human rights due diligence to understand and how their products are actually operating in the real world, and are there ways we should be thinking about um, how we design our products um, and the features that they include to ensure that the way that users are um, engaging with them um, can enable them to be have choice and control um, so that we can have be rights respecting on the company side. Um, but all of that requires um, both on the government side, for them to have strong rule of law and clarity and for them to respect human rights, um, and for companies to do it as well. And then we can sort of work together to deal with these issues. I think um, it has been interesting to see what's, what's happened in Europe around the right to be forgotten. Uh, Google did challenge, um, we, had a, a lo we have a long history of challenging um, that issue in court. And when it became clear that that was going to be the law of the land for Europe, we respect the rule of law and have complied and created um, an, ornate, uh, an ornate way that we comply with the law and allow users to appeal directly to us um, as part of that mechanism. So I do think it is um, 
where these issues are most challenging, it requires there to be significant multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, with governments, companies, and civil society all at the table. Um, I'm going to force myself not to comment because it's a subject that I'm very passionate about. Um, do we have, oh, we have uh, I'll, I'll, one, two, three, Okay, we'll take them in the order going down. that okay. way, and then uh, Rami. Good morning. Um, uh, my name's Biban Kedron. I'm from the House of Lords in uh, the UK, where I sit as an independent. Um, I'm just interested to hear the panel's views about the failure to uphold children's rights in online situations, not least the fact that a child is a person under the age of 18, and we have a de facto age of adulthood online of 13 based on a sort of a piece of very old-fashioned uh, law in the US, uh, COPPA. And so I'd really like to know how you imagine that children's rights could be normatively observed by the platforms, and I should declare an interest just in that we are currently undertaking a general comment on the Convention of the Rights of the Child for the digital world. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. I look forward to the answers. Uh, there were two further questions behind you and further back. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alexander Malkevich from the Civic Chamber of Russian Federation. I want uh, to mention the problem uh, about censorship on the big uh, social networks such as Facebook, Twitter and Google. You know that their moderators perform extensive blogs or even delete accounts where their owners are, trying, are just trying to express their political views. And uh, how, how can we demand from the uh, Facebook, from Google, from Twitter, uh, just uh, to publish the relevant stop lists of words uh, which are forbidden to use on these platforms and in general put an end to politically based censorship. Thank you very much. And uh, next in line, and then Thank Rami. You. Wolfgang Benedek, University of Graz. Uh, my question would be a good follow-up to the previous one. Um, I wanted to have your views on the recent uh, Glavishnik case uh, versus Facebook uh, of the European uh, Court of uh, Justice, uh, according uh, to which uh, harmful uh, content uh, on reputation, hate speech, um, has uh, to be removed, uh, and even equivalent content, and this uh, on a worldwide uh, scale. So on the one side, that can be considered a big move uh, forward in uh, forcing uh, platforms uh, to uh, adopt the policy against hate speech, uh, protect the reputation of politicians. On the other side, there are obvious downsides if this is interpreted in a way of uh, going towards censorship, as uh, the colleague before just mentioned. And if you allow me a second question, um, the Council of Europe uh, was quite successful in developing uh, guidelines uh, for the liability of uh, platforms, um, intermediaries. Um, my question would be, uh, how is the process of implementation of, uh, of, of these guidelines uh, being monitored? Is there any uh, form of uh, monitoring possible? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have about three sessions worth of questions uh, just there. So if I think we should uh, answer those before coming back to another round. Um, I particularly like the last question, but um, does anybody want to go first or should we take it in order of speakers if nobody's jumping in? Okay, we'll start with Jan then. I just wanted to refer for your question, which I think was uh, excellent. It's all a question of norms. Uh, should we like to uh, forget the Holocaust or to let it go? Or maybe we would like to delete the picture of a child who was abused. Should we uh, look at uh, a terrorist who made his will on the 
digital platform and influence hundreds of other people who are going to kill any one of us. 80 people were killed in Nice, France, by a truck driver who was influenced by this. So first of all, it is a question of norms that I know it's, not, it's easy to talk about it, not easy to come with an idea. I believe that the most important way to deal with uh, Facebook, Google, and other is to try and come out together with uh, agreed norms in order to try and come out with the solution how to do it. Meaning, if you want to delete something, which is, the, you have the right not to do it as well, let's come with the norms together with this organization. If you will do it only by a regulation, by law, or by somebody in, in any country, it will never work. We have to team and work together. I think this is the best way that at least I find out when I started to deal with these companies on cyber and, and other things. Because when you're dealing with a terrorist, the same question is coming also for the digital platform. Are we dealing with the content or are we dealing with to make sure that it's a sanitized network? So this is what I can say on that side. Okay, um, Jan. Thank you very much. Oh, um, perhaps 10 seconds per question, given, given the time. Uh, first of all, on the, uh, the balancing of the rights by platforms, I would like to point out that there are, of course, standards. Uh, there, is, there are legal standards, there is clear case law, uh, and in the end, uh, it, will be a, it will be for a court to decide if there is, if there is, if there is a dispute. Um, children's rights, I fully agree, there is much that needs to be done, that needs to be done. Censorship on, on, on social platforms, political, political propaganda. Uh, one answer could be also to, uh, for government certainly, to promote much more public service internet so that uh, uh, citizens would also be able to rely on uh, quality journalism and investigative journalism on the internet uh, supported, by, supported by our governments. Harmful content to be removed, the case by the ECJ. Uh, you raised the question there of censorship, but if it's the implementation of a court judgment, uh, in this case an international tribunal, I think that, that, uh, that is a, a, a guarantee, uh, at least the, the judgment, that it is not just unwarranted censorship. Um, as to the necessity to remove certain content, I would again refer to the speech of Sasha Baron Cohen. Um, on the liability of platforms, the guidelines, uh, they are being assessed at a committee, at committee level, but also very much being considered by the European Court of Human Rights, and I would expect there will be cases where this uh, recommendation will be, um, or these guidelines will be, will be brought up as, as a source of, of the rule of law. Thank you. Um, Florence and then Fanny. Thank you, Joe. I would um, react on the question related to the to the children because we think that it's a, a very very important topic um, under the gdpr there are specific provisions with respect to consent given uh, by the children and processing of their personal data that is linked to a certain uh, age that needs to be uh, defined at national level but showing that there is a for sure a maturity aspect very important on that uh, we have done um, huge work at the CNIL level uh, on uh, children rights, but also at international level with the International Conference of Privacy Commissioners. Uh, we have done, uh, for example, uh, some uh, analysis about the different legislation and the exercise of rights. Uh, and we have done also a kind of reference model uh, for um, um, the, the community of education, of, uh, the, the, in a certain way, tra train the trainer uh, uh, material in order to, to help people in contact with the, with the kids to, uh, uh, to make them aware of their rights. Um, it's, it raised a lot of issues. It raised an issue with respect to the scope of exercise of the rights by the kids and the children. How far, you know, uh, how, what kind of right could they precisely uh, exercise? Uh, it raised also a question about the role of data protection authorities and whether or not they can handle complaints by kids and at which age, and also the problem of verification, mechanism to verify the age and how companies can put that into practice. 
Um, and we definitely think that there is um, a huge work done by other international organizations like OECD and the Council of Europe and the UN that we are trying to follow as much as possible. And we hope that we will be uh, able to influence the discussion at UN level in order to better frame um, the exercise of rights on the digital uh, environment by the children. Let me respond to the to the Facebook case uh, question. And um, so I know it's quite well known, but uh, maybe it's worthwhile to offer a little bit of context for the people who have not read that case, just so they know what is it about. Uh, because for for uh, as a starting point, it's not about hate speech, but defamation. And so the case started back in twenty. 2016, when a Facebook user posted an article featuring the photo of this very well-known Austrian politician and co uh, used uh, slurs like someone, like that she's a corrupt oaf, a lousy traitor, and member of a fascist party. And what happened throughout the litigation is that in the end, Facebook was ordered um, to, to remove the post. But there was a huge legal question to decide whether Facebook should remove uh, identical content going forward or also equivalent content going forward. And that is, uh, that is the major legal question that is now being discussed. And uh, the court uh, opened up the, the whole possibility for a general, uh, general monitoring obligation and the use of automated tools in that context, which is the most problematic part of the decision. Um, and in the European context, we'll see how this is being addressed in the opening potentially of the e-commerce directive or the DSA, the new Digital Services Act. The problem what we see here is it, this case might have really negative implications for freedom of expression, but also to freedom to form opinion, which is, uh, by the way, an absolute right. And it has quite different uh, legal, uh, legal uh, implications afterwards. So um, automated tools are demonstrated not to work as uh, picking up on context and being able to make that uh, human rights uh, decision that is already problematic for courts and, and people. And it also might create this general monitoring tool that violates uh, uh, universal human rights. Thank you. Um, we have a time for maybe two more quick questions and we've already got four. Those two hands went up first. My name is Anke domscheid -Berg. I'm a member of the German Parliament, Internet Policy Speaker for the Left Party. I have a twofold question. The first is we have um, really big issues in Germany because of lacking national responsible contacts of digital platforms. I'm not talking about nice buildings, PR offices and events taking place there. They do exist, but there is no address where you can deliver a court order or where a lawyer can send official letters. They just don't take them. And then they refer um, to Ireland or even the United States headquarters and you never hear again from them. And we have with Twitter, for example, an issue that already in May uh, Twitter blocked a green politician in the middle of political campaigning for a joke he made on Twitter. He is still blocked, although two court rulings have already ruled that Twitter has to open the account. They just don't do it. And they um, refuse to take the court letters. So how to deal with it? And is there an option to um, make a European legislation forcing them to have a legally binding delivery address? And the second is talking about, uh, for example, digital violence against women on those platforms. One issue we have first that those platforms don't take the serious enough, but the second issue is that we have a serious lack of capability in law enforcement in basically all countries I know of, definitely in Germany. It's also an unpunished crime, mainly because you don't have polit um, police people and justice people knowing what to do. So. 
what could be done to help this. In Germany, we are talking about creating a, a specialist um, police authority where at least you have some trained people to deal with these issues. But I would like to know, are there other ideas and how is it dealt with in other countries? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so our question is um, about, our concern is that tech companies are developing policies and practices with states who are known to be violating human rights and digital rights of some of the world's most vulnerable, including occupied peoples. And we want to know how companies like Google are working to ensure that policies and practices that they develop do not enable states to engage in illegal occupation and to commit further human rights abuses and war crimes. And finally, if you can get us, yeah. Thank you very much. Merci de m'avoir donné la parole. Je suis Monsieur Abakar Hassan, député au Parlement tchadien, président de la Commission Communication, Nouvelles Technologies de l'Information et de la Communication, Droits Fondamentaux et Libertés. Euh, J'ai réagi parce que le thème est très important, très porteur, surtout pour nous les Africains, parce que euh, il n'y a pas longtemps, on parlait de la fracture numérique entre le nord et le sud, c'est-à-dire euh, les pays développés et les pays moins développés que nous sommes. Donc, euh, il est très important et ça nous a beaucoup intéressé au niveau du Tchad. Nous avons euh, adopté au niveau du Parlement tchadien 4 à 5 lois sur le numérique, sur la plateforme numérique. Et nous continuons à travailler dans ce sens-là, mais comme vous le savez, nous sommes très en retard et nous avons besoin de votre apport, de l'apport de la communauté internationale dans ce sens-là, en ce qui concerne les droits de l'homme ainsi que la plateforme numérique. Euh, ma question, euh, c'est juste pour dire qu'il n'y a pas une traduction en français, mais j'aimerais bien que les textes les, des différents panélistes soient traduits en français pour que nous puissions les avoir les comprendre et euh, au besoin les appliquer chez nous. Parce que c'est un sujet qui est très important, surtout en ce qui concerne le numérique, euh, Facebook, Google, euh, tout ce qui est attrait aux droits de l'homme, tout ce qui est attrait à la justice, tout ce qui est attrait au terrorisme. J'ai écouté l'intervention du euh, paneliste israélien sur le terrorisme. C'est quelque chose de très important qui m'intéresse parce que mon pays fait face actuellement au terrorisme euh, Boko Haram dans le lac Tchad. Donc, euh, je vous remercie de m'avoir donné la parole une fois de plus et je vous demande si c'est possible d'avoir la traduction en français pour notre bonne gouvernance. Merci. Okay, um, thank you very much. The last intervention for those of you who have made the terrible life choice of not learning French. Um, <laughs> That was a request for um, translations of the interventions of our excellent panelists in order to help decision making in Chad, um, who are working on a um, legal framework and feel the speaker said that they're somewhat delayed in addressing these challenges. So uh, quickly, if we can uh, make a final um, set of responses from the panel, and then I'll try to do a wrap up of this very diverse discussion. Working our way back down from this end now. <laughs> um, so I, I'll um, address the, so a few of the questions that came up. Um, with respect to enabling states to commit war crimes, I think that gets back to what I was saying in the first instance with respect to the Universal Declaration and the UN Guiding Principles and companies embedding, um, really figuring out how to operationalize those commitments in ways that allow them to do due diligence across their business, um, both in how they respond to law enforcement requests, but also with respect to how they launch products and who they sell them to. Um, on the topic of um, digital violence against women, um, I can tell you that platforms do take this issue seriously. Um, at Google, we have a variety of policies um, and products that seek to address some of the ways that these harms can manifest. Um, it's certainly not a panacea, but, but we do have policies that prohibit um, 
our policy against hate on YouTube includes gender and gender identity. Um, and so that means that when someone is inciting hatred based on that characteristic, that protected characteristic, um, content is removed on that basis. We also have a policy against harassment, um, and that includes when, um, that's focused on when the content is based on an individual, a threat to an individual. And we've been clear that actually we are, um, we're evaluating that policy currently um, to see if there is a need for revision and to tighten it up. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to, um, I had some comments on the gentleman who raised censorship issues. I just wanted to clarify that certainly companies, like we are committed to freedom of expression especially in the way that that is articulated in Article 19. Um, there is a freedom of expression and there are legitimate restrictions on that right. And so we ensure that we are following the way that that, um, the way that the law is playing out with respect to freedom of expression, where we are doing business, that we understand how the courts work, how the, what rule of law looks like in a given country, so that we can understand how we operate there. Um, that's, that, that's with regard to how we, respect the law, but we also have policies in place to um, ensure that our users understand our policies. We have to be clear about those. We have to have appeal mechanisms in place. And then lastly, we need to be transparent about what we remove, both with, re with respect to government requests to remove content and with respect to what we remove under our own policies. Thank you. Um, as a wrap up, I, I just wanted to highlight how um, there's an overarching uh, demand for all of these uh, rights implications, whether it's privacy and data protection, uh, to be addressed in a systematic way because it is a, a business model question, an underlying core question, and whether it's competition and market, surveillance, export controls, measures, content governance, including moderation, but also the curation and the design, uh, we need to ensure that uh, the companies follow human rights norms in a predictable way. Yes. Well, very, very quickly, because I know that we are, we are late. Uh, just to answer it to your question, but it will not be a full answer because it will be just on the GDPR aspects so on data protection, uh, not necessarily on removal of uh, harmful content. Uh, we, the GDPR organize a, a coordinated manner to, to answer to um, infringement of the GDPR uh, on the EU territory around the lead DPA that is instructing the case in coordination with the, with the other data protection authority. It's called the one-stop shop system. Right now we are practicing it. Uh, but for the, comp the companies that are established in the EU, have establishment in the EU, we have a system of, uh, of, of cooperation among ourselves in order to uh, instruct uh, the, the violation, the infringement, and to sanction them. We'll see, we, we are in the practice, to, we, we are putting that in practice right now. Given that we're nearly out of time, one sentence as a wrap up, wrap up. We're certainly not short of standards, but we also certainly must do a lot better to ensure they're implemented. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. I personally find it kind of shocking that we're asking quite fundamental questions in 2019. Um, I think that the the first and the last, one of the last questions uh, are the core of a lot of these questions. When are they doing too much? When are they not doing enough? Um, the Council of Europe recommendation on the rights and responsibilities of intermediaries is a very important document that should be the first step in trying to find answers to this. It's not acceptable that legal content is removed. It's not acceptable that illegitimate uh, parliamentarian is taken offline um, and we, we need to, to dig into the, the basic principles of international law that restrictions have to be predictable at least. Why are we talking in 2019 about unpredictable decision making? It's uh, bewildering. But I think if we can uh, leave this room with at least if you know you have a problem, you can start finding a solution. 
if we recognize this as a as, as problem that needs to be addressed and build on the Council of Europe's very good work in this area, then we're heading finally maybe in the right direction. Uh, thank you very much to all of the questioners. Apologies to the questioners who didn't get to ask their questions. Thank you to a very good panel with uh, very good insights. Thank you very much and um, see you soon.